just as a short um, prelude, I wasn't sure exactly, you know, how much or how little uh, people know. So for some people, some of these things will be elementary, other things will not be. Uh, just trying to cover the space, but the assumption for the presentation is that uh, talking to someone who knows about Jamstack um, and may just need to clarify some terms here, but should uh, should be able to follow through. Uh, so yeah, um, and so first part will just be kind of high level overview, uh, and then uh, we'll go into some of the technical depths of building Jolt. So, uh, but before we dive in. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about, you know, the people who will be presenting today. So my name is Rodney Matambo. I currently live in a small island called Puerto Rico. And my co-creator, Chris, lives in Boston, Massachusetts. And so when he heard about Jamstack Boston, we he was like, we have to do it here. Um, and so... You know, I'm excited to be presenting at Jamstack Boston, and today we'll be presenting on Jolt. Um, and as you may know, Jolt is a lightweight um, open source framework that builds and deploys Jamstack applications with serverless functions using AWS. So, you know, as we get to understand Jolt, and this is this is like a condensed version of a different presentation, but. Um, you know, I'll take you through the high-level overview of the space we explored as we walk through what a Jamstack with serverless architecture is, and how you can use you know existing solutions to deploy a Jamstack with serverless application. And then Chris will take a deep dive into how you would actually use and deploy applications with Jolt, and some of the development challenges we faced along the way. And finally, just look at the final architecture. Um, <clears throat> Now, you know, to help us understand all this, we're going to learn from the perspective of a Jamstack developer named Bob. So we're introducing Bob. Uh, Bob, like many Jamstack developers, works for a company that's adopted the Jamstack and has been tasked to look into getting some custom compute capabilities for their team's Jamstack applications. So, you know, one day Bob sees a quote by the VP of engineering at Stackery and um, which basically says serverless plus Jamstack is where web app architectures are going. Uh, now he notes that this was written after seeing how their platform was more and more commonly being used to deploy Jamstack plus serverless um, applications. So Bob starts looking into this Jamstack plus serverless architecture. Now, he he wants to look into a use case for Jamstack plus serverless, right? Um, and so here's a typical picture of a Jamstack architecture, right? We are familiar where you know the static assets are cached on the CDN, dynamic content handled through client side JavaScript and APIs uh, API calls to third parties, um, as we're all familiar with. And you know, Bob knows what the Jamstack architecture looks like in production. He knows the benefits of pre-building static assets and having client-side JavaScript and interacting with reusable APIs. Uh, but he wants to know what are the benefits of using a Jamstack plus serverless architecture. So while researching, he finds that if someone has an e-commerce site, this person may want to use Stripe, for example, in order to deal with payments. You know, looking at our typical Jamstack architecture, the Stripe front-end client could be used to retrieve a lot of information, such as inventory and user information through API calls. And the user could even set up the initial credit card information. But as soon as the user tries to check out, that usually involves the Stripe backend client, and that usually requires a secret, which can't really be placed in front-end browsers for security reasons. And so serverless functions can be used to deal with secrets in the same way that the app server perhaps may, uh, may in a typical three-tiered architecture. They can act as a backend that can hold the Stripe secret as an environment variable that ensures that sensitive data never lives outside of the browser. And then you can interact with these third-party APIs 
while maintaining whatever custom compute you need beforehand. Now, Bob's team is looking to do something like this. So he brings this to his team. And, you know, Bob's team likes the idea of having the uh, being able to have custom compute without managing servers. So they asked Bob to look, go look into what it would take to deploy something like this. Since all of their other infrastructure is on AWS, they asked Bob to start from AWS and see what would go into deploying a Jamstack plus serverless application. So Bob decides to try it out and see what it would be like just to deploy manually, maybe just deploy a simple notes CRUD application using this Jamstack plus serverless architecture via the AWS web console. So he decides to use the basic services of AWS and found that it would require him to know at least five different AWS services. On top of that, you know, he quickly discovered that this process would take no fewer, oh, would require no fewer than 50 individual steps. Everything from manually creating each Lambda and uploading and any required environment variables or dependencies to creating the API gateway, its routes, and linking each of these routes to an AWS Lambda, to setting up CloudFront distributions and dozens of other steps in between. And so Bob could see that this could be a very tedious and error-prone endeavor. And if he was fast enough and knew exactly what he wanted to do, you know, Bob would have to spend at least 15 minutes to provision these separate, uh, these five separate AWS resources. And this didn't even include the time it would take for the distribution of his static assets across all AWS CloudFront CDN uh, servers. So Bob imagined having to do this entire process for each new Jamstack to a serverless application, or at least part of the process every time he wanted to update a piece of his infrastructure, maybe such as the Lambda or API gateway route, and saw that it would be very unfeasible for his team. So at this point, Bob decided to see if there are some solutions out there that can abstract some away some of the complexity and time commitment of manually provisioning AWS resources, just like you saw. Well, you know, Bob started researching as we all would. And some of these solutions that he found um, include, you know, there, well, he found out there are a number of tools that allow Jamstack uh, developers to actually deploy Jamstack to serverless applications onto the cloud. And each one has its own set of trade offs. So some of these tools, such as Netlify and Vercel, were built uh, to make deploying an application as easy as possible. Their focus was providing you know, Jamstack-centric features that enabled developers to easily build these project static assets and package up any additional code, such as functions, to provision and to provision the necessary infrastructure, including any serverless functions, and to deploy these assets to a CDN. Right. And so Bob saw that both Netlify and Vercel rely on AWS behind the scenes and they completely manage the infrastructure for him. And so this meant that he would never really have access to the underlying infrastructure for any of his applications. And additionally, his team would also sacrifice configuration and Netlify and Vercel actually enforce limits on such things as Lambda memory size and timeout limits and how long each Lambda can run and et cetera, et cetera. On the other side, there were other options such as, well, DIY options. These included serverless framework and maybe some AWS specific options such as Amplify and IAC or infrastructure as code, um, which in cloud, encompass things like cloud formation, CDKs, and AWS SAM and web console. You know, these services tended to sacrifice the ease of use and this overall Jamstack centric features um, approach for a more robust infrastructure capability. And simply put, you know, these services or these solutions rather 
um, were as close as you could get to the infrastructure on the cloud uh, with the added benefit of being able to leverage any of the other 140 services within the AWS ecosystem. But the drawback here was that none of these services, or rather none of these solutions, were purely focused on actually helping you launch a Jamstack plus serverless application. And so this results in a subpar experience due to the broad use case for any of these DIY solutions, and also due to their lack of features that are really tailored specifically for Jamstack application. And so still, Bob and his team, right, they needed something different. They needed some happy middle ground between these solutions. And so Bob was looking for a framework where it's easy to deploy and develop Jamstack with serverless applications and the developer would actually own the underlying infrastructure. And so this is where we find Jolt, well, rather introducing Jolt. At its core, Jolt takes a project, builds its static assets, provisions the necessary cloud infrastructure for both the application and the serverless functions, and deploys the app to a CDN, which then propagates these things around the world. Compared to Netlify and Vercel, these applications sit on the user's AWS infrastructure, and it's all yours from the start. And Jolt is 100% open source, so you can fork the repositories and tailor uh, everything to your team's needs. And since Jolt is a lightweight Jamstack plus serverless framework, it won't have many of the Jamstack-centric features um, that Netlify and Vercel may have, but enough to allow a developer to actually easily deploy an app with serverless functions. Now, compared to the DIY solutions, Jolt makes it easy to deploy um, purely um, Jamstack plus serverless applications, and more importantly, Jolt provides that happy middle ground where it's extremely simple to set up on your local machine, provision, and configure the necessary cloud infrastructure and serverless functions. And then finally, you can deploy a functional application in minutes. As, jo as Bob kept researching, he found out that with Jolt, he could deploy a Jamstack with serverless application from a single command, and then all that within minutes. This one command, Jolt deploy, removed the need for all those error, those manual and error prone steps um, we saw earlier when deploying to the a to AWS using the, using the web console. Now, Bob took this information to his team, um, and he told them that you know what was necessary and what the necessary infrastructure was in order to deploy Jamstack with service application. He also quickly touched on how them how to manually deploy um, a simple notes application via the AWS console and you know reviewed some of the popular Jamstack plus serverless options. And lastly from a high level, he really introduced what Jolt was and several of the benefits of the Jolt framework provided. You know, his team seemed convinced that Jolt really matched their use case. So, you know, they decided to dig deeper into how developing applications with Jolt works. And so the first place Jolt, uh, Bob looked was the core architecture of a Jolt application. He wanted to understand the core architecture of any Jolt application without any of the more advanced features. And so, you might remember this diagram that was introduced earlier. Um, these were the core components of a Jamstack with serverless application. Using this diagram as a jumping off point, Bob decided to walk through the core architecture of the Jolt app, any Jolt application. And Jolt largely changed the right side of this diagram, as you'll see here. Every Jolt application uses CloudFront to cache static assets and serve content to the user, um, uses S3 as an origin for static assets, uses lambdas for serverless functions, AWS lambdas, that is, um, and to provide 
a unique endpoint for every Lambda. Each one of these is actually integrated into the API gateway so that requests can be sent to them using the gateway URL with the Lambda named name um, appended to it. And so at this point, Bob could see what the core architecture of a Jolt application would look like. But I'm going to pass things off to my co-creator, Chris, to tell us how Bob may go about deploying his Jamstack or developing um, his Jamstack as service applications. And finally, some of those challenges we mentioned at the start that we faced as we de um, in developing Jolt. So I'm going to. Um, one second, I'm trying to figure out which screen to do. This is my first time using this thing. <laughs> there we go. OK, sorry, now I have to open the system preferences. <laughs> Somebody has a question while waiting. Um, I'd be happy to field that one second. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be curious if you find that, like, when you talk to Jamstack developers, like, what is their sense of serverless? Because to me, I've found that the two of them are actually very like compatible, but they mm -hmm. somewhat live in different worlds. Like, you know, maybe serverless people don't really know a ton about Jamstack and, and vice versa. So I'm curious, like as someone trying to merge those two things, like how much of a culture clash you see there? Well, okay, let's actually that's a very good question because um I remember looking at just the serverless world in, in AWS, right? Um, and noticing that there is this, like serverless is just getting broader and broader and broader. Whereas Jamstack, we are like in the Jamstack world, like when you look at Netlify and Vercel, um, like they specifically were primarily interested in integrating just the API endpoints to get custom compute through serverless functions. And so when you look at, for example, lambdas, they have so many triggers, so many different ways you can approach it. And for 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 like Netlify and Vercel, they were like, oh, we just need this, so let's make our own. And it's like there is this conceptual fit where it's like, well, like if you look at Jamstack, like the Jamstack approach, technically all we're doing is actually like we want everything to be we don't want to manage servers. We don't want to man. We we're basically adopting the yeah, quote like unquote, serverless by serverless. default, essentially. Exactly, but at the on top of that, now it's like okay, well, like now let's just let's now get back that app server functionality, that custom compute, and we get that back by using serverless functions, right? And so and so and so there's like this conceptual fit between the two. But like when you look at AWS Lambda and all the different, like they use it for their internal ecosystem, right? So you now have to tailor that to actually mesh with Jamstack applications. And that's where the fit, that's where the clash is. I, at least I believe, I don't know if somebody else has other input. Yeah, no, I thought that's totally tracks. Like I've been doing this project Redwood JS, which is like very much merging the Jamstack and the serverless world. So like everything you're doing, like it's it very much resonates with stuff I've been doing. Cool. Uh, everyone can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you for bearing with. This is my first time sharing a screen on this. So I had to literally quit out kind of like what happened earlier. <laughs> All right, let's dive in. So. Next up, I'm going to show you uh, how, how to use Jolt. And, and taking Bob's earlier example earlier, um, so let's just say that Bob wants to build that Notes app that we discussed earlier. And, and his application is built using React and it has some basic CRUD functionality that will be provided by the Lambdas that will interface with a GraphQL database called FaunaDB. If you've never used FaunaDB, it's great. So Bob is going to be using FaunaDB for updating storing and retrieving his notes. And so to get started, Bob runs Jolt init from the root directory of his application. 
And as you can see here in the terminal, he's been prompted for answers to a few questions that will be stored locally in a config file. And so Jolt use, then uses this config file to keep track of all the details needed to develop, deploy, and manage his notes app. Sorry, just had a cough real quick. Um, so since Bob needs several lambdas to securely interface with his FaunaDB database, uh, he, can, he can define each lambda as a separate file inside of a functions folder that sits at the root of his application. Um, and then what happens is, uh, so if Bob needs a lambda for getting notes, creating notes, updating notes, he puts each file individually within this functions folder. And, and before we can proceed, it's probably a good idea to like, try to test these out to make sure that they work. Um, and so what Joel provides is a local testing environment um, for, for Lambdas. So one of the big pain points of developing a Jamstack plus serverless applications might be like being able to test locally before you actually deploy everything. And, and without a specialized tool, there's no way to run Lambdas locally. So for instance, if Bob had some bugs in the code for his create note uh, Lambda, he would need to deploy it to AWS, then send a request to that Lambda, then consult the logs, which are in a different AWS service, then make the change to the Lambda locally, then redeploy and so on. So you can see how time consuming this process would be if it wasn't for a, a local testing environment. So to provide a smoother debugging experience, um, Jolt spins up a local development server that lets you to run those Lambdas. And, and here's a quick demo. Is it running? I can't tell. Not sure why. So is it running? OK, there we go. So here we can see Bob is in the root of his notes application. And to test his Lambdas locally, he simply runs Jolt dev. And this will spin up two servers, one that's running his notes app and the other that's running his Lambdas locally. And then once both servers are running, he can then navigate to localhost 3000 in order to view his application and send requests to those Lambdas. So changes to Lambda code take effect in real time and logs from the requests are actually displayed in the terminal, as you can see right here. And this Lambda server can also be spun up by itself, which is really cool. And this might be useful for running unit tests on your Lambdas, for example. So now that he's finished his deployment or his development and made sure that everything works perfectly, Bob is ready to deploy his app. So to start deployment, he simply runs Jolt Deploy. And what happens first is that we, we a build process is kicked off where whatever command that build command that Bob specified during Jolt init, uh, that'll be executed. And then the build process will automatically transform those files, those front end application code into a collection of minified HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, so it will be compatible with other browsers, like older browsers, as well as new browsers. And after building, Jolt provisions all the necessary infrastructure that we outlined earlier. And the static assets and Lambda code are sent to N3, sorry, S3. And then those static assets can now be accessed by CloudFront. And the Lambdas that can then be created from the uploaded Lambda code, which is stored in S3. The final step here is deploying to a CDN, which can take a few minutes to propagate all around the world. But Bob's app, once it is propagated around the world, is fully ready to be used by end users anywhere. So since Bob's not busy with backend management, he actually has some time to develop more new features for Bob Notes. And first on the list is to actually add the ability to delete uh, one of his notes. So after developing and testing his new functionality locally, uh, all Bob has to do is run Jolt update. And this command will once again build the app code into a collection of static assets. And then these static assets and Lambda code are, up, are used to update the existing infrastructure in case of Lambdas being added or subtracted. Um, the, the appropriate Lambda will be created or removed. So in Bob's case, a new Lambda delete note is created. And again, after a few minutes of propagating around the world to CDNs, uh, Bob Notes version 2.0 is live to the world. Uh oh, so if you look here, you can see that something's wrong. It seems to be that the CSS didn't work or something happened. So 
it looks like Bob actually forgot his CSS altogether. So fortunately, we've built in a feature here within Jolt that provides an easy way to fix um, something in the event that a production version of an app breaks. So using the command Jolt rollback, Bob can revert both his front end and his lambdas to a previous version. Rolling back both the front end and lambdas together ensures that the available lambdas will be compatible with the front end of the application. So now having rolled back Bob notes to version two, things are looking nice and stylish all over again, and there's a stable build that's been deployed. So we've kind of walked through just some of the commands that you can use to um, develop deploy and manage your Jolt application. And we really quickly wanted to touch on some of the interesting challenges that we encountered as a team uh, when developing some of these features that we thought were pretty cool that we wanted to really showcase and highlight really quickly. So the first challenge that uh, we encountered was how do we make our endpoints, our API endpoints predictable? And if, you, if you're aware of like a, tradi a traditional <clears throat> Relative, uh, traditional web application, uh, you typically send requests to the back end via a simple and intuitive relative URL, such as get notes. Um, as, as we can see here, we make a get request to get notes. But however, with the, with, with that, the fact that we're using API Gateway, um, AWS API Gateway provides an absolute path endpoint for each of the developer's lambdas. And so we explored two options for providing the developer with that predictable API endpoint. The first option would, have, would be to actually provision the API gateway and then provide the URL to, to, to developers. And I mean, we pretty quickly <laughs> realized that this would have required way too much effort on the developer's end because they would have to wait for everything to be provisioned and then get that endpoint and then actually hard code it into their code base, which doesn't make any sense. Um, so we luckily came across a solution that actually abstracts away all that complexity. And so we decided after much research, um, we decided to use a feature of CloudFront called Lambda at Edge. So these Edge Lambdas are just like, are very much like uh, traditional Lambdas, but they're actually executed on CDN servers. And so they're way closer to the client and this, this results in a serverless computing environment that has low latency. So using our Lambda at Edge, we can actually send requests with a dot functions path prefix to the Edge Lambda. So for example, it'd be dot functions slash get notes would be that, that request. And the Lambda at Edge would actually intercept that and then respond with a 308 permanent redirect, which then tells the client to repeat another request, which would be, then be directly routed to the um, to the to the appropriate lambda. So in this case, that 308 redirect, simply what we do is that response is uh, we, we we take the API gateway URL that we have just previously provisioned and actually um, prepend it to that relative path such as get notes, as we can kind of see here. So it's a little it's a little um, small text, but you can kind of see the, the gateway path there with the slash get notes. So this permanent redirect means that the response will be actually very conveniently cached on the client's browser. So every subsequent request to that same relative path will automatically be routed to the API gateway endpoint. So resulting again in a, in a lower latency. So another challenge that we faced when developing Jolt was dealing with failure during a deployment or update. And so in the event of a failure, <laughs> debugging can be really, really hard, especially across microservices. So, and that would just cost a lot of time for the developer and trying to figure out, okay, what happened and where did it go wrong? So using a quick example, let's say that a user is updating their application and a Lambda update process fails for whatever reason. So prior to a failure, some of the new in infrastructure in this case, in this example, S3, will have already been provisioned which means that a developer could be left with an application that is kind of stuck in between versions. And this also means that there's gonna be extra infrastructure that could potentially lead to unexpected bills for unnecessary services. So we needed a way to ensure that a failure, that a failure to completely deploy or update a Jolt application 
uh, would not cause any of these lingering infrastructure um, to remain on the user's account. So to achieve this, we, we, tended, we, we decided to treat deployments and updates as single units. So either it's, it 100% succeeds or it fails. And this concept is called atomicity. Um, so in the event of a failure, our system takes measures to actually revert the application to the exact same state it was before the process even began. Um, and so if, if the deployment or update is actually successful, all of the information that of all, all of the uh, infrastructure information, such as the ARNs and any identifying information that we might need later on, uh, we actually store within a runtime object and then put it into a DynamoDB table. So all previous versions of your infrastructure exist in their own independent tables in Dynamo, uh, which can be accessed later. Which brings me to rollbacks. So, just like we saw with Bob, where he was able to roll back to a previous version because he forgot his CSS. Um, if a user updates their application and finds that something's wrong, this feature is, is perfect for them. And it allows you to really quickly change um, and roll back. So <clears throat> when rolling back static assets of a Jolt application, there were, there were two paths that we had to decide, and they each have their own trade-offs. And the first path would involve deleting all versions of a file that exceed the version used for the rollback. So let's just say you have five versions, uh, one through five, and you wanted to go back to version three. That would mean deleting everything from version five, everything from version four. Um, so that now the rollback version, like whatever, like all the files in version three would be the, the most recent uh, files. So the downside that is though, is that uh, this prevents the user from, what if they want to go back to version four? Well, it doesn't exist anymore. So we ultimately ended up choosing the second path, which involves re-uploading files from a specific version. So if we take version three, we would actually just re-upload them. And what this does is that this would make CloudFront serve those assets um, as if they were the latest version without having to delete other static assets. And so this approach gave us, uh, this allowed us to go back and forth between versions with the trade-off of there being more S3 storage used. But we ultimately decided that this cost for extra storage was worth it to, to provide the ability to roll back to any version at any point in time. So each time a developer updates their Jolt application, what Jolt does is that we actually create a new API gateway stage. And so this allows us to, what this does provides is the ability to version our actual API endpoint. And so this URL is used specifically for that version of the application and is also stored in that version's um, Dynamo DB table. And in order to roll back to a previous version of the API gateway, all we do is we query Dynamo for that proxy URL used in the selected version. And this information will come in handy during the next step, which is the final piece of rollbacks where we update CloudFront. The first step to do is we need to invalidate the objects that are currently cached by CloudFront because they could still be pointing to um, um, a different version. Like, and, then, and then what this does is this forces CloudFront to retrieve the most updated static assets. I think CloudFront keeps uh, assets um, cached for 24 hours, but we wanted to just force that so that we could immediately um, so that it, it, it will immediately retrieve the most up-to-date or the most update up-to-date static assets. So finally, we take that proxy URL that we query Dynamo in the previous step, and we just update our Lambda at Edge function to route to that specific um, API gateway. So, as usual, um, due to the global nature of CloudFront, this process will take a few minutes to propagate, and but then the selected version the selected rollback version will be available for everybody. So let's quickly see how this process works using our CLI. So running Jolt Deploy will allow users to roll back a version to any version they select. The first step is to, is it not running? Uh, it is running, perfect. Sorry, it's like a really small screen for me to see. So the first step is to select a project that you wish to change. And then within that project, you'll see a list of all the different versions within there. 
And then once you confirm which version you want to revert to, uh, the rollback process will begin. So now that you're familiar with Jolt and all and some of its capabilities, let's take one final look at its architecture. So we've made a few um, improvements over the core architecture that Rodney discussed earlier, namely the ability to use relative paths for function calls to update the application and to roll back to your previous version. So here we can see a client interacting with CloudFront uh, to retrieve the static assets of the site and then making an API call to API Gateway to, to, API Gateway to access lambdas uh, of an application. So encompassing all of this, DynamoDB stores information for each Jolt application. Thank you for bearing with, that is all. That's super cool. I, I can tell you guys have put a ton of work into this. Um, and very awesome. I think this would have a huge, uh, like a huge need for a lot of people in Jamstack to, to use something like this. So um, thanks, thanks for presenting on this. Yeah, thank, thank you for the opportunity. This is this is fun. Just sharing the Jamstack love. Like Rodney and I, we're loving the Jamstack. <laughs> yeah, uh, I had a quick question about. So in your example, you in your functions folder, it looked like you had a lot of JavaScript. I assume those are are Node files in there. Could you use other languages? Like, could you do a Go uh, function or you know something else, uh, Python? That was that was something that. We, we nixed, but yes, the, the idea is like, if, if we were to continue developing this, we'd want to provide support for those additional um, languages for sure. We're, we're, we're big fans of Ruby, JavaScript, Go. So those three would have been, would have been definitely included if we had more time. Yeah, makes sense. And, uh, and so like, what is the, um, I guess in terms of what, what would your pricing model be? Would, instead of, uh, I assume since you, with Jolt, you'd run your own infrastructure, right? Um, for people who don't want to create Amazon accounts and things like that, would would you guys, you know, like do that on someone's behalf, or what is the, I guess, what is the the pricing model for uh, making this project sustainable? The the point behind the project really was open source everything, mm -hmm. and so yeah, like the way Jolt actually works is like. Um, as opposed to what maybe Netlify and Vercel will do, like it will actually, starting from your AWS account, it will actually deploy using like your account. Everything is yours. You can tear down whatever from Jolt, but everything's on is is yours. So the assumption is it like the use case is very specific. You want to get kind of basic functionality like Netlify, except I want to have total control and I want everything to be mine. Um, that's that's pretty much what it's for. So, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, no, it does. I, I think it's uh, super cool that you you put your efforts in and put it open source and a lot of people yeah. that benefit from it. So, thanks for doing that. Yeah. Do other folks have questions? I love Anthony. Shout out to Fallen DB. If no one's used it. You should check it out. It's, it's a great, it's a great tool. <laughs> Our database. Cool. What What are some of the biggest challenges you've faced in developing this? Um. Probably. Well. Okay. So. Well. Actually, I don't know if Chris, you want to take this one. Um. I mean, those are some of the bigger, some of the ones that I talked about were some of the bigger ones that we had to encounter, that we encountered. Um, it was kind of cool though, we, uh, when we when we were developing our MVP, this was before we had the CLI or anything like that, uh, we just found how annoying it was where we would, and that's part of the reason why we had the local t testing because we would deploy and then realize that, oh, our create notes app or our create notes um, functionality didn't work. And so we'd have to, redeploy, wait five minutes, fix it, redeploy, wait five minutes, and then, oh, this is, wasn't working again. So that's why Owen just set out and he actually created it all himself over a weekend, which is really cool. I thought it was fun uh, and implemented it, baked it into the project and it became a core feature. Um, so 
in terms of just, yeah, just challenges, I think the stuff that we mentioned, but I don't know if Rodney has anything unique from what was mentioned earlier. Um, not really. I would say, I would just highlight, like, when building out rollbacks, like, we had to basically like figure out how we're gonna version our API. Um, mm -hmm. And that was kind of interesting because you're starting with a functions folder, right? And then you're like, okay, we're gonna, like for every project, we need to keep track of the exact state of the entire API. And then like, if we're gonna roll back from any version, uh, it's gonna it's gonna mean that I have to, I have to keep a way to keep track of all the functions that we have at any time. And these folders can be nested. Um, and so it was like dealing with that was kind of kind of difficult. Um, and so yeah, I'll, I won't go into much detail, but yeah, that was that was definitely part for me that was difficult. Um, yeah, one, one thing that I didn't directly, I wasn't directly involved in, but I thought it was really cool is that we ended up using, um, is, it, is it Netlify that had Zip It and Ship It? Yeah, the Zip It and Ship It yeah. library. So it's cool because we, we, what we do is we actually like, we'll go through your functions folder and we will, and, and we actually had to customize that, this open source feature that they, that Netlify released, but to, to, in, in order to grab all of the dependencies and the environment variables needed for each Lambda. So for example, it might be like a Fauna DV API key. And I just thought it was really cool that like oh, one of our teammates, uh, Ezra, he went in, he he made it so that we could grab those, those key things and then upload that to Lambda um, in, order to, in order to let them function. So that was a really cool challenge that uh, one of our teammates figured out. That's awesome. And uh, if you were to like, what would the the next version of Jolt look like? Would, would it be adding more language support? Would it be uh, extending to different infrastructure? Would it be a web based interface to, to do <laughs> yeah. some of this stuff? Like, what what would it be? Or is it just there's a perfect exactly where it is? Yeah, the, no, there were so many. It's never perfect, right? We all sure. know that. <laughs> no project is ever perfect. Yeah, it's true. I, I mean, a big thing. I'm, I'm just to talk about Rodney here, but a big thing that he really wanted to do was like a nice, a nice front end, like a nice, like like I said, like a web console, um, to to be able to interact with all of this. But that that got put on the chopping block just because we realized there's so many things you want to do, but so little time. Um, that was probably a big thing. Also, being able to um, have have this all provisioned and routing to a, a custom URL would be a big thing. I think that's through Route 53, if I'm correct. But um, mm -hmm. Rodney, anything else that you would have wanted to add? Um, no, nah, like like when when you're part of the co-creator team, you're like, yeah, let's add this, let's add this. Let's, and I'm like thinking about, you know, uh, hearing uh, Mark, I think Mark was presenting on API Mesh, I was like, what if we could add, and I'm like, nope, stop it, <laughs> stop it. And yep. so I'm like, um, well, one of our things was we wanted, like, we wanted to explore the Jamstack space and just kind of tackle its tough chat problem and contribute to the open source community. And so at this point, like, there are a lot of things I would add, but um, for us, we're like, we set out to get these things done, we did. And so we're leaving it open source. If people want to go around, play around with it, uh, move forward, uh, very open to that. But uh, I think we are like, OK, we're going to stop there. Um, and we'll, we'll move on. Very cool. I mean, there's something to be said about doing a specific thing and doing it well. So um, yeah. Well, that's great. Well, thank you both so much for coming on and presenting. I really appreciate that. It was fun. Yeah, Jim. Thank you. Thank you again for the opportunity. It's been fun attending yeah. last meeting and this meeting. So.